Good morning. Our reading again today comes from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. This is the word of God for the people of God. So as we're getting a little bit more into the details of the basics of the Bible, we're looking at these 27 books, most commonly referred to as the New Covenant, commonly called the New Testaments, at least in terms of what Tertullian coined that term in 208 AD. He wasn't referring to this set of books necessarily as much as the New Covenant that God was making through Jesus Christ, one of the most important messages we can have in this 27 books that slowly built over time, about 300 years, until 397 AD at the Council of Carthage was kind of the stamp of approval of these are the 27 books that are going to be the New Testament to go along with all of these that are on the Old Testament, which we'll talk about next week with Pastor Carrie Lynn. And I think it's so interesting that Christianity, historically and currently today, is, has the most adherence the most followers, or at least people who label themselves as Christians throughout history and today, 2.3 billion people in the world, and it's the smallest religious document that there is, depending on how many notes I guess you have. But 27 books, most of them only a few pages long, have produced this worldwide movement that is the most adhered to and most global religion that there is. I I think that's fascinating. Some people constantly, or some people have asked me in the past, um, especially after books like Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code came about, and there's this whole kind of revelation of, oh, well, what about Bell and the Dragon? Or what about the Infancy Gospel of Thomas? Or what about the Gospel of Peter? Or the Gospel of Mary? Or any number of, you know, Uh, pseudo-canonical books that might be out there, um, how did they pick these books, right? Because it's 27. It's fairly exclusive as to what made it in and what didn't make it in. And there are really three criteria. And the thing to know is um, Jesus didn't write any of these books. Um, In other religions, Muhammad or others, Siddhartha wrote the sacred text. And they are these sacred figures, essentially. I mean, they would say Muhammad is not a sacred figure. That's very important to know. But the, the lead figure in that religion wrote the sacred text. Here we have Jesus who didn't write anything down. And in fact, most of it wasn't written down until people started writing snippets of what they saw. And the first letter we have in the New Testament is Galatians. Um, earliest letter we have is Galatians, written about 49 AD. And if we think Jesus died around 30, 33 AD, there's a little bit of a time between, you know, when those events happened and when the earliest copies of letters, or earliest understanding of the letters that we have, come about. And so there's a little bit of a gap there. We know there was oral history. We know the movement. And, and this is the fascinating thing about the letters coming a decade after the movement, is that it has already picked up steam to the fact where there are already churches all around the Mediterranean without 27 books to guide them. There is already steam because of this tradition that is building these stories that are being told. And so how they got collected into what we call the New Testament today is uh, there was a threefold kind of criteria. And the first one um, of why it makes it in is apostleship. The early church wanted to have the most uh, closely related eyewitness accounts. Um, And so this is the 12 apostles, and then also including Paul, who had this experience on the road to Damascus with Christ that they count as authoritative. And so every book in the New Testament um, that made it in was said to have some very valid, authentic relationship with an apostle as the earliest eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry here on this earth. Why does, like, the infancy gospel of Thomas or the gospel of Peter not make it in? Well, it's because they were seen as written too late. The, the language wasn't the same as the original apostles would use. They were written too late, and so they were found to be written by maybe followers of the disciple or, follow, or followers of the follower of the apostle. And so those didn't make it in. The second criteria besides ap- apostolic authority was um, Catholicity, which is Catholic. It means the universal nature of the church. And so— um, 
the inspiration of this was something as common as what is already being read, what is already being helpful. And so these letters and these gospels were being circulated around. Um, once they were written to a church, that church would share them with another church, or the gospels were passed around as kind of a chain letter. It was kind of the, if you don't forward this, you will not be blessed by God kind of emails that you get. Um, and so they were forwarded around. And so they looked at, well, what is already being helpful? What is already being accepted by the church? And if you look at like 1 Corinthians 15, at the end of it, there is a creed. It is thought to be the earliest statement of faith in, that we have in Christianity. Well, that was included in the letter because it was already widely used. It was already widely accepted. There was, a, there was um, certainly conflicts within early Christianity, but there was also a lot of unity around what was accepted already. So apostolic authority, Catholicity, and then the um, third qualifier was continuity. And that does what flows with what is already being taught. What agrees with the gospel lesson that the apostles were taking all over the Mediterranean, that Paul was taking even farther than that, and what we see in the letters of Galatians and Colossians and Philippians, all of these letters primarily are written to communities who are struggling with the continuity of what the gospel message was and what they're now being taught or living out by people like an Arius who taught that, well, you can't kill God. So Jesus actually didn't have a physical body. It was just kind of a, a pretend shell that God's presence was in. And then there were other people who said, well, no, it was actually a person, but God's spirit left Jesus before he died. And then there was Marcion, who um, some of y'all may really like Marcion, because Marcion was not a big fan of the Old Testament. Uh, Marcion actually wanted to establish a Bible that he, kind of like Thomas Jefferson did, he took an exacto knife out and he cut out the entire Old Testament, and then he took out every quotation of the Old Testament in the New Testament. So what you're left with is about six pages of content. Because Jesus came in Matthew 5, says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law, which the Old Testament is very important to that con continuity message. And so Paul and others, Peter, are often fighting against the discontinuity. They're fighting against what is the message we've already— adopted, known, and spread, and why is this, um, why is this different? What's well, a little interesting that just the fact on the side about books, um, I, I told you Galatians is the earliest um, known letter that we have, followed by First and Second Thessalonians, and then you get into some of the other letters. Um, the order of the books in the New Testament is the order in which, the order of importance as gauged by the early church. So Mark is actually the, the first gospel written, earliest chronological gospel written, and then Matthew and Luke borrow from Mark, and then John isn't written until like 100, you know, 80 to uh, 80, 100 uh, AD. And so what's fascinating is when we look at the Bible, you, you think that it kind of reads like a story. Well, the reason they are in the order that they're in is that the early church deemed Matthew to be the most important gospel. Well, you know why? Because it deals with how to be a church. They deem John to be the least important gospel because it deals a little bit with what they consider Gnosticism. You have to know certain special knowledge in order to accept it as more spiritual and it didn't include the story. Now, it's important. It made it in there. And I'll leave you to form your own conclusions about Jude and Revelation at the end of the Bible because they almost didn't make it in, um, historically speaking. Now, I find value in those, so I'm glad that they made it in. But just a little tidbit and a little fact about how this was put together. No, um, but regardless of what the early church may have thought about the Gospel of John, I will say that if I was going to sum up the New Testament, which I'm trying to do in 20 minutes or less, if I had to sum up the New Testament of the why, I would pick these two scriptures. If I can find them, I want to read them straight to you. John chapter 1 the Word was first, the Word present to God, God present to the Word. The Word was God, in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through Him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without Him. What came into existence was life, and the life was light to live by. The life light blazed out of the darkness, the darkness couldn't put it out. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. If I had to go, and then the next one, 
This is how much God loved the world. Some of you may recognize this in a little ways. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son, and this is why, so that no one need to be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending a son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when introduced to him. If I had to sum up the New Testament, I would point you to the incarnation, and I would point you to the death and resurrection and forgiveness of sins. Because it's the new covenant, right? It's not the old covenant. The old covenant was one of law. It was one of holiness. It was one of sacrifice. It was one of appeasing God through our behavior, through our sacrifices. It was one of this new understanding of the world, this revolutionary, radical understanding of justice and peace for the world. But in order to do that, you had to be holy and you had to be perfect. And there was all sorts of uh, parts that we had to play in terms of being holy so that God would also be seen as holy. But here we have something incredibly different. Here we have this understanding that, as Paul says in Romans, that all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And it's kind of a recognition that no matter how many laws or statutes we're given, no matter how many prophets come speak to us, that we're probably not going to get it right. That somewhere along the way, we're probably going to continue to not live into the full grandeur of everything God has for us. And so what does God do? God puts on flesh and blood, takes on flesh and blood, and moves into the neighborhood. I love this language. Moves into the neighborhood to come and to be the example, to show the way, to heal us, to, to not point an accusing finger, but to bring us along and to ultimately lead us to the example and, and of sacrificial love, true sacrificial love of dying on a cross knowing that he was innocent and that we were guilty, knowing that he was innocent and ultimately showing how perfect love works, that even when he was innocent, he still went through that because he knew he was going to come out on the other side more powerful. Maybe not him more powerful, but us more powerful. More powerful because we know that death is not the end. More powerful because we know that sin is not what defines us. More powerful because we know that God's grace is the most important thing. This is the new agreement and the new covenant. And that would be the basics of the New Testament. But you may have noticed that I chose a different Bible than we normally read. Especially if you're so used to, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, you heard something different. Or if you're familiar with John 1, I, I picked this version of the Bible. It's called The Message. Um, it is a paraphrase of the Bible. It's not an interpretation because it is not a Greek one for one like the NRSV would be, uh, New Revised Standard would be. Um, this was put together by a pastor named Eugene Peterson up in Minnesota. Um, and he put it together because he found that his congregation was not reading the Bible. And why were they not reading the Bible? Because the Bible made no sense whatsoever. Um, I don't know if they had the King James Version. It was just really hard to comprehend the these and the thous and the thys and all of those things. Or there's a certain element in which even the New Testament, even the New Testament is removed contextually from what we experience today. We talk about the Old Testament being so removed and so different because it's the Old Covenant, and that's not why— we're Christians and living in the new covenant or this new understanding of what God is doing for us. No, it's the understanding that even in the new covenant, there is an entirely different culture being written into. There's an entirely different mindset of the people receiving these letters. And I'll, I'll say that I think that we can sum that part up of what the difference is between what we understand and how we read the New Testament and how it was meant to be received and how it was meant to be read. And it comes out of the Sermon on the Mount in a section called the Beatitudes, which is chapter 5, the very beginning of it. And it's the blessed are you who, blessed are you when kind of statements. And it says, you're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. 
You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And know that you are in good company. My prophets and witness have always gotten into this kind of trouble. When's the last time you got in trouble for the gospel? When is the last time you said something so radically uncomfortable that people couldn't stand your presence? When's the last time that you said something so controversial about the kingdom of heaven that people thought you were a raving lunatic? That is the culture in which the New Testament was written and received. That is why Paul is consistently telling the Thessalonians, you know what, stay busy, keep your head down, because there's a good chance someone's knocking on your door to come arrest you and perhaps kill you. That is why Revelation has this undertone of fear is because it is a message of empowerment actually against the Roman Empire that is coming and knocking on their door to try and take their books and take their churches and, and squash this thing. What, what I mentioned is so fascinating at the beginning is we've got 27 books, the smallest religious document that's out there, and yet it caused massive tidal waves of fear amongst the Roman Empire and amongst the people of these days. The authorities who are in power are so afraid of these people who have absolutely no power about them, and yet the message is so controversial that it strikes fear in the heart. And, and I just did some digging to see what was so scary about these group of people. I mean, these are people that are like not in my backyard kind of people. You don't want them around. And, and I did some digging to figure out, maybe you'll hear something in here as to why they're such a scary people. Let's see. Um, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and your heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You wouldn't want to be these neighbors with these people, right? It gets worse. Here's another old saying that deserves a second look. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that going to get us anywhere? Here's what I propose. Don't hit back at all. If someone strikes you, stand there and take it. If someone drags you into court and sues for the shirt off your back, gift wrap your best coat and make a present of it. And if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. No more tit-for-tat stuff. Live generously. Aren't these people the worst? Let's, oh, hold on. It gets worse. You're familiar with the old written law, love your friend and its unwritten companion, hate your enemy. I'm challenging that. I'm telling you to love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you, not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with the energies of prayer, for then you are working out your true selves, your God-created selves. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm and the rain to nourish, to everyone regardless, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. If all you do is love the lovable, do you expect a bonus? Anybody can do that. If you simply say hello to those who greet you, do you expect a medal? Any run-of-the-mill sinner does that. In a word, what I'm saying is, grow up. Your kingdom subjects, now live like it. Live out your God-created identity. Live generously and gracious toward others, the way God lives towards you. Don't you hate people like that? They're the worst. You can see why these people were so controversial. All of this talk about loving your neighbor and loving your enemy, all this talk about generosity, all this talk about pouring out. I mean, look at what his followers did. His followers after Pentecost started a community where they don't consider anything theirs. They share it with other people. They're the worst. And I make fun of that, except if I were to tell you to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and go follow Jesus, what is your first gut feeling? If I were to tell you that we should establish a community where we have no common or no private ownership of anything. Those of you who lived through the 60s and the 70s, what is your first thought? Hippie communes and communism. Socialism. 
If I were to tell you that we were going to base our school bullying response on praying for the bullies and giving them the coat off our back, that we're going to overcome darkness with love, what is your first response about how you parent your kid? No way. Punch him in the mouth. What I'm saying is that the New Testament is written to a group who actually knows what persecution feels like. The New Testament is written to a group that literally is under threat through all of the timeline in which the New Testament is written. If they carry the books, if they quote the books, if they are worshiping what the books are pointing towards, they are under threat. And as much as we might claim persecution or threat on any kind of level, we have no idea what it feels like to be persecuted for loving our enemies like our friends. In fact, one of the problems that people see with the church, the hypocrisy they see in the church, is that we are very happy to persecute our enemies and very happy to celebrate when our enemies fall. In fact, we become protective. And I would point back to October 28th of 312 AD, which is the moment when Constantine won a battle to become the emperor of Rome. And he credits the battle to God giving him victory because he had a dream the night before of a cross on a shield. And so he had all of his soldiers paint crosses on their shields, and then they went and they won the war. And so overnight, Christianity goes from this movement where you had to be in it. You had to love your enemy by choice. And you had to give of yourself by choice. You had to follow this moral exemplar, this savior of the world who gives himself up for the good of the world in this completely radical way of grace under fire. You had to choose to be there. And Christianity was already spreading like wildfire, regardless of this self-giving message that didn't fit with the power dynamics of the time or the power dynamics of today. But you had to choose to be in it. And October 28th of 312, all of a sudden Christianity went from being an outlaw religion that you had to choose to being something promoted, to being something in league with the most powerful person in the state. And this is not meant to be a political statement at all, except for a general political statement, but people with power don't tend to like to give up power. And so all of a sudden, when your faith is merged with the most powerful people, and I tell you, give it all away. You're blessed to be a blessing. Your example is somebody who gives his life for you so that you can give your life for someone else. Do you see the disconnect? This is why the New Testament can sometimes be misinterpreted or hard to understand. It's why Dr. Russell Moore, who um, used to be uh, the head of the Ethics and Religious Liberty um, Forum for the Southern Baptist Convention, recently did an interview with Newsweek magazine where he was quoted as being alarmed at the number of pastors who had come to him or that he had um, had relationships with that were being fired from their pastorate or put on suspension for preaching um, anti-Christian messages. Those anti-Christian messages were pastors who were reading from Matthew chapter 5 through 7. The passages I just read from you, for you. The love your enemy and turn your cheek and give of yourself and pray in private and all of these things. They would preach these messages and the congregation would come to those pastors and say, that doesn't work. Why are you preaching all of this namby-pamby hippie agenda? And Russell Moore, who was, is an incredibly committed servant of the church, got concerned enough to take this public and say, I'm concerned of how much power we're not willing to give away. So again, if I were to summarize the New Testament in those two passages, what's the first one? John chapter 1. I'll tell you what, let's go to Philippians chapter 2, who kind of puts a different spin on it. Philippians chapter 2 says, For God was so humble, God self-emptied God's self, when God was so much higher above us, so much more perfect than us, so greater than us, but instead chose to humble God's self, to take on flesh and walk amongst us and be with us. 
God took on flesh and blood and became one of us, moved into the neighborhood, not to avoid the problems that we were causing, not to punish us for the problems we were causing, but to be in the midst of the problems that we were causing and lead us out of the problems into something that looked more perfect, something like the Sermon on the Mount. But we know that's hard. Because we're humans, we have pride, and if there is a snake that's telling us to pick the fruit that is going to make us better than everybody else, then we are going to pick the fruit. And so for, this is how much God loves you. That even in the midst of sin, even in the midst of imperfection, God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son. Not for you to perish. Not for you to be destroyed but so that you may have eternal life and life abundant. The New Testament is really small, but it's really powerful. It's 27 stories, letters, accounts of God's Son, Jesus, who points us in a way that we perhaps could never have imagined on our own, takes away all of our sins so that we have every capacity to do this with Jesus, and then tells the story of an early group of people who actually try and do this. They actually try and live with faith. They actually try and live. They chose love and grace and mercy over and against their own health. And you know what it did? It worked. You know when it stopped working? When we chose our own power. One of the reasons I want you to read the New Testament over and over and over again is because it holds a great mirror up to our preferences versus God's preferences. And I'll tell you what, 10 times out of 10, whose preferences do you think we should go with? Let's pray. Gracious God, we commend ourselves into your spirits because your spirit is true and your spirit leads us through the narrow gate. The narrow gate of mercy, of grace, the narrow gate of the footsteps of Christ. And God, it is hard to give up everything that we own. It is hard to give up some of what we own. It is hard to give up the power that we have. But you have led us to this narrow gate and invited us in as friends with all knowledge of what lies on the other side. Toward the end, you gave this vision to John of a city without walls, a city with no dark, a city with no violence, a city that is open to all people, that all people will flock to because of the goodness that lies within. And so, God, may we have faith in this vision. Faith enough to lay down our swords. Faith enough to give of our cloaks. Faith enough to go as sent by Jesus to share the gospel and teach and baptize in the name of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, so that all may be instructed in the ways to lead to this city. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.